The day after Thanksgiving 2019, I'm trackside bright and early in Poplar, North Carolina, a town of 215 residents scattered among the hills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Visiting family in Boone for the holidays would warrant at least one day set aside for train chasing along the nearby Clinchfield Railroad. Old Union Switch and Signal P5 color lights still guard the north end of Poplar siding, dating back to 1952 when centralized traffic control was installed between Irwin, Tennessee, 10 track miles to the north, and Spartanburg, South Carolina, 128 rail miles south. Today, this is the CSX Blue Ridge subdivision, and at the time of filming, Q693 is the only freight running south during the day, while northbound Q692 was well above my position before sunrise. I was in luck this morning. Q693 departed Irwin around 7.45, about an hour later than usual, and could be heard climbing the 1.5% compensated grade through the Nolchucky Gorge until it rounded the bend here 30 minutes later. Three General Electric locomotives, including an AC 4400 CW wearing its as-delivered YN2 paint scheme, are headed as far south as Spartanburg on this crew. 693 originates daily in Russell, Kentucky, with a final destination of Waycross, Georgia. The 25 miles per hour track speed will allow an easy chase through the mountains. I continue down the windy Route 197 to Pigeon Roost. The bridge here is one of several along the route that still display the Clinchfield name. At Green Mountain, I set up on the other side of the Tow River, which flows northwest, joining the Cane River near Poplar, forming the Nolichucky River that flows through the gorge to Irwin. In the opposite direction, the tracks follow the North Tow River up the hill, allowing a relatively easy 0.75% compensated grade to the Blue Ridge Summit. Six ninety three is usually light on tonnage, moving just fine with only two locomotives on line, which seems to be standard practice through here. A third rides along used only to assist on steep grades or any increase in tonnage while working stops between Russell and Waycross. If it's not needed, shut it down to save fuel. Past Green Mountain, no easy chase route follows the tracks, 
so I continue on Route 197 and 226 to Spruce Pine, beating the train with well over a half hour to spare as they wind along the Tow River's sharp bends at 20 miles per hour. This allowed time to check out the station and Chessie caboose sitting on the siding here once used by the local switcher as a shoving platform. It doesn't appear to have moved in quite some time. 100 pound rail from the war era is still in use in the spruce pine yard, which looks more like a passing siding, though it is used for local traffic that serves the region's rich mineral industry, including KT Feldspar and MinPro, and the Quartz Corporation below town. There hasn't been a switcher based out of spruce pine in almost a decade, the work is handled by the Yellow Dog Local based out of Kingsport Terminal, 90 miles to the north. I quickly pack up my things and race to the Vance Tunnel only four miles away, but a wrong turn cost me dearly. By the time I show up, so did the train, and it didn't help that my camera wouldn't focus, so this is all I have to show for it. I continue down to North Cove where another set of US and S signals stand on borrowed time. The railroad refers to these automatic block signals as Avery, and the ones below here have been replaced by Vaders, what rail fans like to call modern signals because of the large single hood over the lenses. CSX, equipment defect detector, milepost 205.1. No defects. No defects. Total axle 24. A nearby detector chimes in over the scanner reporting 242 axles, or 56 cars in addition to the locomotives, which are in dynamic braking as the train nears the base of the Clinchfield loops. Since this is the last location, we'll watch the entire train pass the camera. Most of today's train appears to be chemical traffic out of Kingsport from Eastman Chemical Company, the largest freight customer along the route. The facility is so large that it is twice the size of downtown Kingsport and has its own dedicated coal train serving the cogeneration plant that provides power and steam. Coal, of course, has major roots on the clinch field at one time averaging 600 daily carloads move south from mines clustered in the heart of Appalachia. Today, coal traffic is a fraction of what it once was, though power plants in the Carolinas still receive shipments over this route. Once the end of the train clears the block, the signal here will go dark, likely until early tomorrow morning when Q692 comes north, or so I thought. As I hopped on Highway 221 to head north back to my uncle's place, I got word of a coal train soon departing Kingsport Terminal, so I deviated back across the mountains to Unicoi, Tennessee. 
I wasn't sure if I would make it in time, especially after getting stuck behind a log truck slowly making its way up the hill for several miles. But not long after I set up at the north end of Hannam Siding, N759 rounds the bend, making its last descent above Irwin, before turning and climbing towards the Blue Ridge Mountains behind the train. The 110 car train is bracketed by a pair of big GE 4400 horsepower locomotives on each end, originating at Bailey Mine in southwestern Pennsylvania, ultimately bound for the Marshall Steam Station in Terrell, just north of Charlotte on Lake Norman. I continue to follow this train below Irwin and up to the summit until I ran out of daylight, which can be seen in my video Heavy CSX Coal Train in the North Carolina Mountains that I highly recommend viewing after the end of this video. In the cold of January 2020, we returned to the Clinchfield setting up on the Route 80 bridge high above the North Tow River in the unincorporated town of Booneford, North Carolina. Almost half the railroad is on curves, and this location is no exception. The longest straight accounts for only two of the 277 miles between Elkhorn City and Spartanburg. The black stuff you see down there is grease, dispensed into the throat of passing wheel flanges to reduce friction on curved tracks. Although flange greasers are scattered every few miles, the squealing of steel wheels on this route is inevitable alerting us minutes in advance that their chase train of the day is approaching. The lead locomotive is a GE AC 4400CW, still wearing its as-delivered YN2 paint scheme from 1999. Six ninety three is a late one today, passing this location at eleven fifteen in the morning. Normally, they'd be completing their descent down the other side of the mountain by now. It's no wonder the Carolina, Clinchfield, and Ohio Railroad was named the quick service short route between the central west and southeast. The direct north-south route maintains easy passage through four mountain ranges, aided by 55 tunnels and 80 bridges, which keep the railroad close to river grade. Eighteen of the tunnels were bored on the famed Clinchfield Loops, an engineering marvel allowing the railroad to zigzag up the east slope of the Blue Ridges to a summit of 2,628 feet, over 4,000 less than the nearby Mount Mitchell, the highest point in the state. The elevation changes 1,200 feet between Alta Pass and North Cove along 20 miles a track, maintaining a 1.2% compensated grade, far less than the Southern Railway's 2.2% grades through the Old Fort Loops located 18 miles to the south. The average grade is 1.09% without compensation, a term referring to the added drag experienced in curves equating to about 0.04% per degree. With this in mind, the engineers tried to keep as many tangent runs as possible between the five horseshoe curves, the tightest being 10 degrees. Seven labor camps scattered across this challenging terrain contained up to 3,000 immigrant workers risking life and limb to balance the cuts and fills while blasting through the mountainside. The stories of death, murder, and disease are not unlike other major engineering projects during the turn of the 20th century. 
The toll on human life, as well as an estimated price tag of over $1 billion in today's money, makes the clinch field among the costliest mainline railroads ever built, averaging $3.6 million per mile, almost double the typical cost. At the top of the loops, we set up for 693 at the rock face portal of the Blue Ridge Tunnel, which slices 1,865 feet through McKinney Gap. Without wasting any time, we pack up and head only 3,000 feet down Peppers Creek Road to Labor Camp 2. With the train having to slowly traverse six miles in this time, we hiked a half mile through the woods to a unique vantage offering a view through three tunnels at once. Within a minute of setting up, the headlights emerge from the speedy tunnel and into the 2,211 foot lower pine tunnel as seen through the 341-foot bird tunnel directly in front of our location. This is one of the only locations in the east that you can look through three tunnels at the same time. I figured with the short drive down the hill to North Cove, this would be a great spot to capture the whole train emerging from the tunnel, moving at a higher track speed of 30 miles per hour down the hill. By the time we got to the base of the mountain, darker clouds rolled in carrying a light mist. It's a short drive down the rest of Peppers Creek Road to get here, but another 12 miles by rail and 30 minutes since the lead locomotive emerged from the Bird Tunnel. Continuing south, the railroad crosses over the western leg of Lake James just above Marion. Once again, the Clinchfield Railroad left its mark on this bridge, which is smaller than the famous Copper Creek trestle above Kingsport, but is still an impressive structure in my book.
10 miles above Bostic Yard at South Thermal, here are those Vader signals I was talking about earlier, displaying a clear for our last shot of 693. At this point in the day, we were fairly hungry as the clock struck two, and you serious train chasers know just how long we sometimes go without food. After taking time to eat and converse with some rail fans we met during our chase, we got word of an empty Terrell coal train sitting in Bostick with a crew on board. When we arrived back here at four, the rain seemed to stop, or at least until the train rounded the curve when it let loose again. Only the first locomotive is online, able to handle the light empty hoppers back up the hill. Back at Lake James, I set up for a more impressive view of the train crossing the 811-foot bridge. Running under the symbol E759, they certainly were not breaking any land speed records, taking 40 minutes to traverse the 17 miles from South Thermal, which thankfully allowed enough time for the rain to pass. I couldn't tell why they were moving so slow, as it's my understanding track speed between Marion and Ashford varies between 35 and 45, though this is going off some pretty old track charts. Perhaps the speed has since been lowered, though at the time of uploading this video, there has been track work and talk of increasing speed on many portions of the route. The future looks bright for the Clinchfield, and let's hope it stays that way. At the rate they're moving, we're losing daylight fast on this short winter day, closing in on 5.30. The goal was to get the train one more time in the loops before dark, so we set up at another old automatic block signal in Ashford, around the first horseshoe curve from the signals where we shot 6.93 earlier in the day.
Additional units have been turned online to provide extra pulling power up the hill. Even though this train is empty, wet rail attracts fallen leaves creating the railroad equivalent of black ice. Locomotive wheels can slip uncontrollably on excessive leaf buildup, grinding them into grease, and I'm sure you can imagine what problems that can cause. Overall, it was another good day along the Clinchfield, and several other rail fans were out to see the action. But our trip was far from over. Day two would be far busier and clear sunny skies followed behind the storm that moved through overnight. The next morning our plan was to head down towards Poplar for Q693, taking a longer route following the tracks. As we were nearing Spruce Pine, unexpected static on the scanner caught our attention, so we pulled into town. The moment we stepped out of the car, the familiar sound of squealing flanges grew louder, so we ran up the hill to Locust Street for this vantage overlooking the town. This is Q692, the way cross to Russell counterpart of 693, no doubt running a few hours behind today, getting a late start out of Bostick. This is good news for us though, as it gives us a bonus train for the day and something to occupy our drive north to intercept the 693. The wood and stucco depot was constructed in 1909 just two years after Spruce Pine was incorporated, named after the abundance of hemlock trees in the area. But it's not the thick forest that made this a popular railroad stop. Instead, the mining of mica, emeralds, feldspar, and quartz along 25 miles of land brought settlers and wealth to the region. The quartz crystals mined here are so pure, they are used in the silicon chips found in computers and phones. It's possible you're viewing this video with a small piece of spruce pine in your own electronic device. At Green Mountain, we found an unpaved road following the tracks on the same side of the Tow River. The many twists and turns on this stretch of railroad provide good sun angles for lighting in both directions. My advice is if you keep the sun on the nose and the same side of the train you are shooting from, while also keeping the shot free of shadows, then it will turn out good 100% of the time. Using this logic helped us scope out this S-curve on Google Maps, where the tracks head south toward the sun, giving us great light on the two AC-44s, Tier 4 SD-70 Ace, and ET-44 AC on the head end of this morning's northbound. Not sure where to get them next, this scene along Huntdale Road made the decision for us, capturing quite well the vernacular of Southern Appalachia. I have no idea why there's four locomotives up front today, since only the first two are providing power. 
It's possible the two trailing units are bound for a set-off up the line to be used on a mine run, which shuttles hoppers back and forth between the main and branch lines to the mine loadout. This practice is unique to coal country, since some of these branches stretch out for miles without any other customers along the line, often requiring their own dedicated crew to shuffle and load the cars. Though we won't explore any of these operations on this trip, it gives us reason to make another visit before cold demand slows for good. By now we were wondering where 693 could be, so we continued to Poplar, only to arrive too late as the trains were already meeting. So we quickly turned back to Huntdale for a scene of the famed Free Will Baptist Church established here in 1900. It's 9.30 on a Sunday morning, but no one was around, though apparently most services around here start at 10. SD-40-3, bracketed by the pair of Jeevos, is a nice surprise in our mix of catches, certainly adding a good bit of noise as they work their way south through the mountains. This time we were able to repeat the river shot at Green Mountain in fantastic light. If you were wondering about this bridge earlier, you're not alone. I did some research and found out these pedestrian suspension bridges are quite common in Appalachia, with close to three dozen of them in western North Carolina alone. I didn't make any attempt to cross as who knows when it was last inspected, but rest assured the weight limit is four persons. After this, we drove straight to Alta Pass. In the distance, 693 blows for a grade crossing near the north end of Tow River Siding. The signal to the south end is located on this side of the Vance Tunnel, since the turnout starts immediately on the other side. The terrain starts to shake as the train enters the 527-foot-long tunnel. Not far behind us, the train crests the 2,628-foot summit, which just so happens to be the same elevation as the top of the famous 17-mile grade in Altamont, Maryland, on the CSX Mountain Sub, though newer track charts show the elevation here a foot higher, which technically makes the Clinchfield CSX's highest mainline mountain crossing, though 17-mile grade has a much steeper descent of 1,700 feet with grades averaging over 2%. It's my understanding this route serves as a relief valve to other parts of the CSX system, including the A-Line down the east coast and the KD subdivision to the west between Corbin, Kentucky, down through Etowah, Tennessee. 
Not long after our visit, more unit trains such as grain and ethanol have been routed this way, increasing the likelihood of seeing more train movements during the day. We chase to the bottom of the mountain at Avery, but I'll spare that shot right now since we've already seen it twice. With word of a coal train about a couple hours behind 693, we return to Peppers Creek Road with the goal of documenting another tunnel. This one wouldn't be easy to access, and while the pictures don't do it justice, you'll have to take my word on the steep 600-foot climb needed to get to our next spot. I took these pictures halfway up the hill while my camera and tripod were strapped to my back. After 40 minutes of lugging our gear up the hillside, we finally made it to the north end of Rocky Siding. The signal here has a doll arm, and if you remember the explanation from my Buffalo and Pittsburgh video, you'll know that indicates there is a track between the one governed by the signal. In this case, the siding between the main track is governed by the dwarf signal on the ground below. All other passing sidings on the Clinchfield loops were removed except this one, which was extended further south in 1977 to achieve a length of over 8,000 feet, made possible by converting the third rocky tunnel into a wide cut, thus leaving only 17 tunnels on the loops. The horn sounds like it's going away from us, and that's because it is. As they cross Peppers Creek Road on the mountain across from us, they head north before rounding a horseshoe curve into the first rocky tunnel, soon emerging from the second rocky tunnel in front of us with a pair of GEs leading more loads for Terrell from a mine near Loyal, Kentucky. If you remember my comments earlier about lighting, you'll see this isn't the most ideal situation because the sun started to move over to the other side of the tracks while we were waiting, resulting in what we call nose light. This means both sides of the subject are dark from shadows, except the nose of the locomotive. But if you're taking photos with a long telephoto lens, this is some of the best light you could ask for. One distributed locomotive brings up the rear, passing us at 1.30 in the afternoon, concluding our visit to the Clinchfield. Let's just say it was easier getting down the hill and without any other traffic on the radar, we continued west to Canton for the night with the goal of catching the Blue Ridge Southern the next day. I hope you subscribe and tune in for the next video, and enjoyed our rail fanning adventure along the Clinchfield Railroad. We hope to visit again soon to check out more tunnels, bridges, and signals. So until next time, thanks for watching.